Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship. It's lovely to have you with us as we come together to praise and worship our God once more on this Sabbath morning. Well, as we come to our final chapter in Mark's Gospel, we come to look at Christ's triumphant resurrection from the grave. All along, we have been seeing how Jesus truly is the Lord over all, and how he is worthy to be followed immediately. For many today, however, they do not see the importance of the resurrection. They ask us to give them evidence or they simply disregard it as a fairy story. And yet the reality is that the resurrection is one of the most recorded events in human history. Both within scripture and also within secular historians. Sadly, many don't believe. Today's society believes that all that matters is what happens in this life and who cares about the next. And yet for the believer, we know that this life continues for eternity when we die, either in hell or heaven. That's what scripture teaches. Those who don't believe in Christ and his resurrection, well, they go to hell for eternity. Again, scripture teaches that. But those who do believe in Christ and his resurrection will spend eternity with him in glory. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That is the hope of the gospel and that is the hope we are going to see from Mark 16 today because Jesus is, as our opening hymn reminds us, he is Prince and Saviour. It says, Lord of life triumphant, risen now to reign, King of endless ages, Jesus lives again. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we have hope in life and death. Let us stand to sing Jesus, Prince and Saviour.
Well, let's bow before our God's throne of grace as we pray. Let us pray. Jesus, Prince and Saviour, we come before you today to give you our praise for who you are and all you've done. We adore you as our sovereign one who reigns over all, who plans everything right down to the last detail. You are, as we've been singing, the king of endless ages, our king of glory, who deserves the highest praise. Father God, there are many who think that they are in control when really they are far from it. For just one word from your mouth and they would be cast down from their positions of power. And for that we truly thank you. O blessed Trinity, we come to you today as your created beings to ascribe the greatness of our Lord and Saviour. We rejoice in the fact that you are our living hope when all seems hopeless. The resurrection and the life in a world that is dying that you open up the gate. And you give us access to your throne of grace. Lord, we praise you for being the friend of sinners. Because that is what we are. We have gone against your word. We have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have allowed legalism to harden our hearts. We have had used unkind words and have wrongly judged others. Instead of living for you, we have sought after self. And instead of living in harmony with one another and practicing forgiveness as you've called us to, we've allowed bitterness to get in the way. Father, would you forgive us our many trespasses? Would you nail them to the cross of Calvary, in which you were mocked and crucified for us? You who had no sin, yet for us you became sin, so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you, Lord, for dying on that cross. And we praise you, God, for raising Christ from the dead so that we too might know his resurrection power in our lives. Would you help us, Holy Spirit, to honor you as the Lord of life triumphant, whose every victory won, paid, and passion ended, all his purpose done. Lord, hear these our prayers. In the name of your Son, in the power of the Spirit, for we ask it for his sake. Amen. Well, boys and girls, do you want to come down to the front? Uh, And I'll meet with you there. I know some are away to the GB enrollment. Great job. Well, how are you doing this week? Good, yes. All we're okay at school? Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. What's coming up next month? Christmas. You're absolutely very right excited about that. Yeah, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. Great. Well, normally at Christmas time, this movie would come on the TV. Does anybody know what it is on the screen? Do you know what it says? Narnia. What is Narnia? The Lion, the Witch, the Word. Have you ever watched it before? No, you've never watched it before. Well, if it comes on this Christmas, I want you and your families to sit down with a bowl of popcorn and watch it because it's a great movie that has a great story to tell. Because I'll tell you a bit of a synopsis of girls. I won't spoil it too much, but anyway. Basically, it's about four children, okay? Two sons of Adam, named Peter and Edmund, and two girls, or sons of Eve, or daughters of Eve, and they're called Susan and Lissy, okay? And they go away to live in this big house because it's during the war to be safe. And there's a big wardrobe. And whenever they open this wardrobe and go inside, they come to a place called Narnia. And here's the problem. There's an evil white witch. And she has taken over Narnia and she's frozen everything. And she claims that she is the queen, when really she's not because these children are actually the kings and queens of Narnia. But then there's one of the boys called Edmund, and he well, he betrays his brothers and sisters. He's out one day, and all of a sudden the white witch comes along, and guess what? She says to him, how many are you? How many of the family do you have? Will you bring them to me because I want to meet them? Well, she's telling a lie because she wants to get rid of them. She wants to get rid of them. It's not terrible. Yeah. So then, as, t- as the story goes on, things get a wee bit worse, okay? But Edmund, 
Well, he's betraying the brothers and sisters. But they all forgive each other. But here's the problem. The white witch. She says, Edmund has betrayed his brothers and sisters. And because of the old dark law, he must die. But there's a wise lion in the story. Does anybody know his name? Congregation? Aslan, yes. Aslan comes and he's very wise. And he stands there and he says, I will take Edmund's place. Do you know what he does? He takes out in his face. And he's taken away and he's mocked and he's beaten. And people spit at him and they shave his beard off. And the white witch kills him. But here's the good news. The next day, Aslan comes back to life. Why? Well, if you have it up on the screen there, both, yeah, keep going. Aslan says, the willing victim who had committed no treachery died in a traitor's stead. The stone table would cry and death itself would begin to unwind. Isn't that amazing? He gave his life for Adam who had done wrong. And tell me, boys and girls, what does that sound a bit like? Go ahead. Jesus died on the cross. Absolutely. Yes. Because like Adam, we are all sinners. We have all done bad things in our life called sin. And we deserve the Bible says to die. But Jesus gave his life for us. He went and died on that cross to take our punishment so that we could be free from all our sins when we trust in him and live with him forever in glory. Because, as our next verse reminds us, the next one, yeah, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. <coughs> Jesus died to save us. Isn't that great, boys and girls? So this Christmas, if you see that movie, Remember when Jesus died for us. Now, can we say a verse together after a few? <coughs> One, two, three. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd is his son for us. I'm going to sing your song now, which reminds us uh, that yes, Jesus Christ is alive today, I know. I know it's true. Well, maybe send this through twice. Okay, let's stand and say, Jesus Christ is alive. Mark chapter 16, and we're going to read all 20 verses. God's Word says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, bought spices so that they 
might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will, be, will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Amen. And we thank God for his word and let's take a moment to pray for his blessing to be added upon it. Father, as we come to your word again, we are truly blessed to be able to sit under it. We're truly blessed to have your word in our own language in which we can seek to understand it. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would help us to understand what you would have us to hear today, because we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, have you ever been told news that's just unbelievable? I'm sure we all have. Whether that be a medical diagnosis, the birth of a relative's child, a friend's death, or even those exam results you thought you could have done better in. Many things can take us by surprise, and for some, they are like Adams here, who says, I don't believe it, prove it to me, and I still won't believe it. I remember when Hannah first told me that she was expecting Eliza, I came in after a very rotten day, and she told me that she was pregnant, and I said, I don't believe it, but she was, and I just wanted to tell everybody. Some news is unbelievable, whether in a bad or a good way. And this morning we come to an account that many have deemed as unbelievable, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sadly, many don't believe it happened. However, for the Christian. It should move us to tell everyone about it because we've been saved to everlasting life in Christ. This was the case on that first Easter morning as the ladies headed down in Mark 16 to anoint Jesus' body. Upon seeing the open and empty tomb, they're in this state of disbelief. Despite the angels declaring that Christ has risen. Even the disciples after Mary tells them about Jesus' resurrection And even when Jesus appears to them, they still don't fully believe. We're going to see under three headings that we're to follow the Lord as our life giver immediately. Because without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no hope, both in this life and in the life to come. Ryle rightly notes this, that the resurrection of Christ is one of the foundation stones of Christianity. 
And the question we must ask ourselves is this. Do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Firstly, the woman flee in disbelief. Verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Remember last week, Joseph and Nicodemus, they only had time to quickly wrap and bury Jesus before the Sabbath when no work could be done. And in passing, it's very sad that many Christians today don't have the same respect for the Sabbath. We are meant to see so work and we aren't meant to make anyone work for us. That's what the fourth commandment teaches. And that's why these ladies go after the Sabbath to anoint Jesus' body. Interestingly, they didn't remember Jesus' declaration that three days later he would rise again. But do you notice their determination? No time is spared for Jesus. Verses 2 to 3, very early in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? This stone was likely a ton weight and they certainly couldn't move it. Indeed, Matthew's gospel recounts that a soldier was to guard it. So they have two problems, the stone and the guard. Yet they were still determined to do this for their Lord. And that's the challenge for us. Sometimes we think that we aren't able to be used by God. We feel weak or inadequate. However, I believe these mentalities are another tactic from Satan to keep us from serving Jesus. I wonder, is the Lord calling you to do something? To start a new ministry? To serve in Sunday school or campaigners or mothers and toddlers or something else. And yet you say, I'm not able. I couldn't do that. These ladies were determined that nothing would stop them from serving their Lord. And nothing should stop us either from serving our Lord. May our resolve be the same. Remembering Hebrews 13, 21. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. As God calls, he equips. So off they go, verse 4. When they looked up, up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. The very things that they had feared, well, it was rolled away and the guard wasn't there either. And so naturally they go in, don't they? And they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Well, you'd be alarmed yourself, wouldn't you? And yet the angel explained, doesn't he? Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter... He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. All that Jesus promised happened. He truly rose from the dead. His body was gone. John records that the the grave clothes were even folded in his place. Truly Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the life giver whom we are to follow immediately. As Begg declares, by his resurrection, Jesus declares that sin has been dealt with. Dead is dead. And Christ has conquered. Notice the angel mentions Peter by name. Despite his three denials, Jesus has forgiven him. And not only that, but he has use for him. How wonderful to know that whenever we slip up and sin, Jesus still loves and forgives and wants to use us for his glory. Yet despite all they saw and heard, verse 8 says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, scholars, you'll maybe see it in your Bible, have claims that Mark 16 ends there. With the woman in disbelief, afraid to tell anyone. 
However, we know from the other Gospels, they tell us that they go and they testify about what they saw and they heard. And that is why I feel that verses 9 to 20, although slightly different in their tone from the rest of Mark's Gospel, they are appropriate for us to study. Because secondly, we see the disciples persist in unbelief. Naturally, these ladies are in shock. However, as verse 9 continues, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. John records a detailed report of how Mary thought Jesus was the gardener. However, Jesus calls her and she clings to him. Seeing her saviour moved her from disbelief to belief. And Jesus declares in John 20, 17, Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. You see, when it comes to Jesus' resurrection, yes, there is a time for clinging, especially in sorrow and distress. But there's also a time for telling. And so she went out, verse 10, and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. You see, Christ's resurrection, it requires us to go and tell. You cannot sit back as a Christian and keep this wonderful good news to yourself. If we have seen Jesus and we know him to be alive in our lives, then we must tell others. Sadly, however, When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, what did the disciples do? They did not believe it. They're stuck in unbelief. Even though Jesus continually said that I will rise again, he's told them on many occasions, but they're slow learners who need to see in order to believe. And you know, many people are like that today. Show me Jesus exists. And I'll believe. Give me some evidence. And I'll believe. And that's been the cry for many generations. But the reality is if you read your Bible at all. And you look at the lives of those who are genuinely saved. Then you cannot help. But see Christ within them. The hope of glory. You know I meet folks regularly. And you just know. That they're a believer. By the way they speak. And they act. And react and interact but I wonder is this true for each of us today are we Christ represented as on earth as we're called to be do they see something different and desirable in us because they should sadly the disciples don't believe Mary and indeed even after Jesus appears to two of them walking in the country as verses 12 to 13 record These returned, they reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Sometimes folks are so hardened to the gospel that it doesn't matter what you say or do, you'll never change their mind. Like Doubting Thomas who said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Then again, even if they did see, They still wouldn't believe. I wonder is that somebody here today or listening online. Spurgeon once said, unbelief will destroy the best of us. But belief will save the worst of us. Who are you putting your faith in? For as Jesus told doubting Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. At the end of the day, there is only so much that we can do as believers to convince people of their need of Jesus. Ultimately, it is the Spirit's work to draw people to salvation, not ours. And yet, like Mary and these two witnesses, we are still invited to proclaim and hold out the gospel of Jesus Christ to an unbelieving generation. We must leave the evidence before them. And pray that Christ will do his work as we follow the Lord as our life giver. For thirdly, we see the disciples moved to belief. In order for any of us to be saved, 
We all need to be confronted by Jesus concerning our sinfulness and unbelief. You see, Christ's gospel offends because it tells us that we are not worthy or good enough to be saved. Not one of us. We're sinners who deserve to die in hell. And yes, God is love, absolutely. But he also rebukes us in love in order to show us the error of our ways in order to restore us back to himself. Jesus does this in verse 14, doesn't he? Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven. As they were eating, he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Sproul writes, Jesus rebuked them because they failed to receive the news of his resurrection on account of their hardness of heart. When people disbelieve the gospel, it is not because the gospel lacks proof. It is because they love their sin. You have noted it before. That there is more written evidence concerning Jesus' resurrection as a historical fact in God's word and by historians than any other historical event. And yet still people are thran and they refuse to believe in Jesus. They've hardened their hearts to the gospel. And I wonder could this be said of any of us? Hebrews 3.15 says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Confess your sin. Open your heart to Christ and know his resurrection power in you. And if we are a believer today, then let us not allow anything else to get in the way. Legalism, traditionalism, man-made religion or any influence from outside in the world to harden our hearts. The disciples, they basically became Pharisaic. They shut themselves off from the rest of the world. They didn't want to believe anyone. Unless they saw Jesus himself. Wasn't that the Pharisees' problem last week? They wanted to see signs in order to believe. They said, let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. And then we may see and believe. To be a Christian, Jesus says, is to walk by faith, not by sight. We're to take God at his word. We're to tell others and follow him as the life giver. As Jesus instructs, go into all the world, verses 15 to 16, and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. Praise the Lord that even when we feel him, He still forgives and sends us out to tell all creation about his resurrection gospel. Indeed, the disciples, they were anointed to perform these signs of verses 17 to 18. Never underestimate the power of Christ through a believer who truly lives for him. So having commissioned his disciples, verse 19 says, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and they sat at the right hand of God. Finally, after so many years and conversations, the disciples now move from unbelief to belief. As they went out, verse 20, and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied the lip. Now, although we mightn't see these signs today, there are still signs that God is at work through his people. People's lives are being changed. People are getting safe from sin. God is working to make us more like Christ. He is restoring broken relationships. He is bringing healing to some and hope to others. Our God is still at work. So never underestimate what he can do through those who believe and who willingly serve him. Perhaps again we need to say with the boy's father in Mark 8, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. To close, there was a man in Temple Patrick and for a long time he was so close to salvation but there was just something that was blocking him from coming to faith. And we know now that it wasn't God's timing. 
Anyway, we started this men's group called Rethink as part of my licentiate project. I've mentioned it before. And one of our last discussions was on Genesis 3 and sin and life after death. And for him, he just couldn't understand how the resurrection could take and take place. So we chatted and we read from God's word. We prayed. We watched an interview with Professor John Lennox. And apparently he never got it out of his head. I'm glad to say that before I started in Clagan and Order, he came to believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I spoke to him recently and this is what he said. He says, the things that spoke to me the most was the conviction and the passion that you had to make Christ known. He said, you listened and you cared about my opinions even when I was wrong. You helped me understand scripture and the truth that Jesus Christ really died for me and really rose again to bring me to everlasting life and glory. It brings a tear to my eyes even to read that. Now he's seeking to grow in faith. He's seeking to witness to his colleagues and work. Now I didn't save him. Christ did through the work of the Spirit. Friend, never give up speaking with a family member, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor who is outside of Christ. Love them, care for them, and always point them to the Savior because he alone is the life giver. And as we've, thought in our stu- as we've seen in our study in Mark, we are to follow the Lord immediately. For as Paul declares, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. As we end our study in Mark's gospel, it's not the end of the story. Let us never tire of declaring Christ's resurrection gospel so that all may hear and see and believe in Christ as Lord. Amen. As we respond to God's word, we sing our next item in praise, which reminds us of that glorious morning, bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave, Christ rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip of me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. What an assurance as we sing in Christ alone and the offering will be received.
Let's join once more in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you as our hope alone. And we thank you for being our light, our strength, our song. And we praise you for going to that cross. For dying to save us from our sins. For taking our rightful place of scorn and shame. But we worship you today as the life giver. The resurrection and the life. We rejoice that Christ is indeed risen. And he is seated at your right hand judging all the earth. Would you help us Holy Spirit. To follow Christ as Lord immediately. And help us to declare his wonderful gospel of truth to everyone that we come into contact with as you've commissioned us to do. We simply marvel that you would save us. And indeed that you would use us for your kingdom purposes. But yet Lord we admit that sometimes we are slow like the disciples to believe. Oh would you help our unbelief. May we honour you as our holy and majestic God and Saviour. Father God, once more our TVs are engulfed with the news concerning Israel and Gaza war and the Ukraine war and once again we pray into these situations. We do long for peace and justice to prevail and that the oppressed and persecuted would find peace and rest. And for those who oppress and persecute that they would see the folly of their ways. We desire to be peacemakers. And Lord, we do thank you for this ceasefire at the moment, this Israeli and Gaza war. And Lord, we do long that this ceasefire will be a ceasefire and that the end of the war would be in sight. Lord, we pray for our governments and the United Nations that we would find resolutions to promote reconciliation between the nation. We pray for innocent civilians, the elderly, the children, that you would protect them and meet their needs. We continue to remember the military coups in our world in Myanmar and India and Afghanistan. Others, Lord. Again, we pray for peace. We pray for world leaders as they seek to influence and help to bring reconciliation. We think, think too of your churches in these lands and particularly we pray for the Presbyterian Church in Myanmar as they support and encourage their members through this ongoing civil war, especially as they care for communities who have been displaced by the fighting and the villages surrounding PCM's headquarters. Lord, would you shine your light into these dark places and bring hope, we pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the vision that Jim shared with us regarding Geismere Wednesday past. We realize that it's a major project that they're seeking to do and a lot of money is needed. And yet what a history of mission and ministry over the years that has taken place in that area. And we praise you for it and we look with expectancy to how you could use Geismere once again for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray for Jim and the board of trustees as they meet with trusts and partnerships with businesses and groups to raise funds for this endeavor. Father, there's such an opportunity to do outreach and gospel work in this place. And we thank you for the opportunity to do so. Lord, we do ask for big things. But we do come to an even greater and bigger God. And we pray that your will will be done in Geismere. And that everything will fall into place if it is your will moving forward. Good teacher, we come to you today. And we pray for our local schools, for church town and orator. Cookstown Primary and High. We give you thanks for each pupil and teacher and board of governor and member of staff. We're so blessed to have a Christian leadership in each of these schools and we pray that this will continue, especially in this increasingly secular world. Protect them, we pray, and help them to strive for godliness in all they do amongst our children and young people. And we particularly pray for the interviews this Tuesday for the new principal of orator. And we ask that you would go before us as a board of governors to have wisdom and discernment concerning the candidates. Father God, we need the right person in this position who will work with us as churches and who will seek to promote the Christian ethos of the school. Make it so clear in these interviews to the one you have chosen. May they be saved with a desire to build upon the witness that has gone before. 
Lord, undertake and lead, we pray. And finally, great physician of body and soul, we pray for all who need your touch connected to our church fellowships and community. For those who grieve, for those who are unwell or in hospital or nursing home, those awaiting results or appointments, for those struggling mentally and emotionally, for those who are finding their Christian walk difficult and who need you to continue to lead them by your still small voice. Oh God, you know each person. And in the stillness of our hearts, we name those whom we are concerned about to you. Lord, would you meet them afresh, we pray, and give them all they need at this time. For we ask all of this in the hope and certain truth of the day of the resurrection to eternal life, for Christ's sake, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Final hymn reminds us of the hope that we have in life and death because of Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension as we sing Christ our hope in life and death. Let us stand to sing.
may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with you and your loved ones this day and then until Christ calls and comes and then forevermore.